Good morning to my 10 o'clock people. Wow. Uh, the worship was amazing this morning, was it not? It was so awesome to stand down there and I can actually hear our voices. And I can only imagine the thrill that it brings to God's heart when he hears his people sing. If it makes us feel that way, how it must make him feel to hear his children sing. My name is Randy, if I'm a new face to you. Um, I serve as one of the pastors here at Three Crosses, and it is a delight for me, me to be able to share the word with you this morning. Um, and to kind of launch us into that time and get us thinking along the same lines, I have a question for you to contemplate in your mind for a moment. Have you ever been lost when you didn't know you were lost? Every day. <laughs> lost, but you didn't know you were lost. Uh, I was thinking about this question in relation to our message this morning, and my mind went back almost 40 years when I was a university English teacher in China, in Wuhan of all places. Anybody ever heard of Wuhan? Yeah, Wuhan kind of got on the map, right, back in 2020. Um, prior to that, most Americans had probably not ever even heard of Wuhan. But for me, Wuhan was home for five amazing years as I taught English there. Now, mind you, the China of the 1980s was very different than the China today. How many have been to China ever? How many were in China more than 25 years ago? China has radically changed in the past 30 years. Um, American cities don't change the way that China, China reinvented itself as a country. And so the China of the 1980s was quite different than the China that we know today. Um, there were no private cars on the road Back then, it was third world in terms of economic development. Uh, most people for transportation, they relied on bicycles. That's what I had. I had my black flying pigeon bicycle that I rode all over the city of Wuhan on. Um, or lo a bus, local buses, people would travel on local buses around the city. And for longer distances, most people traveled by train. There were very few that traveled by air, um, mostly business people or government officials or foreigners who were tourists or living in the country would sometimes fly to different places. So if a city had an airport, um, it was small. Even the Beijing airport was small back then. The Shanghai airport was small back then. And they were crudely furnished. The airports were crudely furnished. And the experience of, of air travel oftentimes was an exercise in frustration, an exercise in unpredictability and uncertainty because flights were often late or sometimes canceled with little or no um, notice or information. So in the spring of 1985, um, I experienced my first Chinese New Year in China. Chinese New Year is like their Christmas holiday. That was the big holiday that everyone celebrated. So like all of my students and all of my co-teachers, I was blessed with a month's break from teaching. So I celebrated by taking that opportunity to travel to another city in the south of China where I had made a friend um, who was a dental student in the city where I was working. And I actually decided to fly for this trip for Chinese New Year because I wanted to have a little bit of extra time with my friend and his family. 
And my flight was not a direct flight. There was a connection in another city in the south. So when I landed in the connecting city, I made my way through the small airport to the gate where my next flight was supposed to depart from. And I waited and waited and waited. And there was no information about my continuing flight. So after what felt like an interminable amount of time, using English and the smattering of Mandarin that I had managed to learn in one semester there in China, I went to try to find out information about what was going on with my flight. And I was told by the personnel there in the airport that there was no information about my connecting flight. So I go back to the gate and wait and wait and wait. And finally, I was so frustrated that I felt like I had to get out of the airport. I just needed to blow off some steam from this interminable waiting. So I walked outside the airport and I noticed a bus stop there. And there were buses that were rolling up and then taking off and rolling up and taking off uh, a local bus stop. So I decided that I was going to go on a bus. So I go over there to the bus stop, and when the bu next bus comes along, I got on the bus. And I felt so good. There was this exhilaration that I was actually moving again. That's what I was wanting to do for about one minute. And then it dawned on me that I had no clue where I was going. But there was that exhilaration, that moment of exhilaration before I realized that. So ironically, as I look back on that situation in the context of today's message, even when I was feeling the exhilaration of being on the move again, I was already lost. I just didn't know I was lost. I hadn't realized that I was lost yet. So I've come to think, and you may see this on your notes if you got the note paper this morning, being lost and not knowing you're lost is the worst kind of lostness. It's the worst kind of lostness, but you just don't realize it, right? Being lost and not knowing you're lost. So in today's text that we're going to look at, as Jesus begins to bring his Sermon on the Mount to a conclusion, he speaks to the people who are listening to him of a group of people who are going to discover surprise, surprisingly to them that they have been lost without even knowing it. As we come to the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, you may notice that Jesus' words are becoming more serious, more earnest as he concludes this message. So today, he is talking to people who have sung godly songs. They've prayed godly prayers. They have sat in countless worship services just like this one that we're in right now, all the while believing that they were in the favor of God and on their way to heaven. Well, let's look at what Jesus says in the text that we have in front of us today. Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. These are the words of Jesus. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. How horribly tragic and pitiable is that? I mean, to live a reckless life up to Judgment Day and then stand before your Maker is one level of horror. But to play the saint and to be deceived by your saintliness, that's another level. For us in modern day culture, which says, you live your truth, I'll live my truth. It may be hard for us to believe that there are even people like this. 
and even harder for us to believe or consider that we might be one of them. But here we have this text, these words of Jesus glaring us in the face. And what we have here from Jesus is actually a kind of transcript that is going to be spoken to some people on Judgment Day. So if we take it at face value, it could make us lose sleep at night, right? In this passage, Jesus is talking about people who are traveling to hell in church clothes. Here at the end of the greatest sermon that has ever been preached, Jesus exposes the stark realities to the religious lost. The stark realities that he exposes are that mere intellectualism, mere emotionalism, and mere activism are insufficient for the hope of salvation. So let's take a look. First, and you'll see this on your notes, Jesus shows the insufficiency of intellectualism. Point number one, correct doctrine is insufficient. Of the person who would say, I know such and such about the Bible and about Jesus, and so I'm saved. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, that's the right thing to say, right? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. The men and women that Jesus refers to in this scenario, they were addressing him with the appropriate term. They were calling him Lord. They didn't approach him as a mere prophet or a religious teacher. They addressed Jesus in royal terms, as exalted majesty. These religious people, they knew the scriptures. They knew the right books to read. If they lived in our time, they would know the right podcasts to listen to. But according to Jesus, calling him Lord didn't open the kingdom of heaven to them. Knowing the right mantras, knowing the right verses, knowing the right doctrines, like which mode of baptism is correct, he says these things are not sufficient to guarantee the gift of eternal life. Correct doctrine is insufficient in and of itself. Secondly, Jesus shows the inadequacy of emotionalism. Emotions are inadequate. Here, Jesus speaks of those who would say, I have warm feelings when, when I'm in church. Did you have warm feelings during our worship time this morning? Did you get goosebumps when you could hear the voices of your friends around you singing the praises of our God? So that must mean I'm saved. This is the person who chokes up in musical worship or during a convicting message. So if asked if they feel affection toward Jesus, they will answer, of course. Can't you see it in my tears or hear it in my trembling voice? Lord, Lord, a double Lord, said with emotion, said with passion, said with conviction. Yet from Jesus, they hear the reply, depart from me. Proving that powerful, positive emotions toward Jesus are not in and of themselves adequate in our response to him. Correct doctrine is insufficient. Emotions are inadequate. And thirdly, Jesus reveals the fantasy of mere activism. We live in a culture that is big on activism, don't we? Social action. I've done great things. 
I've even done great things for God. And Jesus shows us number three, activity can be deceptive. Activity can be deceptive. In verse 22, he says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? These folks took action in the community and at church. They performed visible and seemingly effective works for others. They served in the parking lot ministry at church or on the safety team. They helped out in children's ministry or as an intercessor in the prayer room or working with a community organization for the benefit of others. They acknowledged Jesus to the world. People heard them speak out for social justice. They watched them serve on behalf of the urban poor or of children. Many mighty works, even in the name of Jesus and the church. And the conclusion for these people is that this counted for less than they thought. They were used of God, as we might say in our time. Surely they must be his. And yet they heard Jesus' words, depart from me. So what are we missing? What are we not seeing here? One of the things that I think we might be missing is the fact that among the multitude of people who were listening to Jesus teach this sermon, and back in chapter five, when the Sermon on the Mount began, it says that when he saw the multitudes, he began to teach them. So there was a multitude of people who were listening to Jesus, just like there's a multitude in here today. And among that multitude, there were the religious elite, or we could say representatives from the religious establishment who had come to listen to this young prophet who was becoming so popular in the culture. They wanted to hear Jesus. And as we read the Gospels, if you continue to read the Gospels, we see that these folks were not too fond of what they were hearing from Jesus, were they? So I can't help but think that Jesus was speaking these harsh words for the hearing of those religious skeptics who were listening in. The people that Jesus describes on Judgment Day in this scenario, they thought, they felt, and they acted at times like saints. But their lives were marked by sin. They listened to Jesus as he preached the Sermon on the Mount but they went away not to cut off the limbs of lust from their lives, not to cease their adulteries, not to end their hatred toward their neighbor or to relinquish their anxieties in their hearts or to resolve their charitable judgments toward others. Nor could they be bothered to knock, ask, or seek for the Spirit's help in these things. Their righteousness, as Jesus would say, didn't exceed that of the religious leaders. The religious elite, some of whom were undoubtedly listening to Jesus preach this sermon, they vainly thought, as you may have thought, or maybe you still think, that hearing is sufficient. That what they heard when they went to church, when they went to synagogue in their case, was enough. They thought that the public display of religion, putting an offering in the offering bag, saying a prayer in a righteous tone, and they felt that feelings, they thought that feelings were enough, but they continued to practice sin. The gospel, you see, didn't make any difference in their lives. So here in the latter part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus shows us where the rubber meets the road in terms of us as individuals and the kingdom of God. According to God's word, 
We are justified by faith alone. Amen. We are justified by faith alone. But my friends, not by a faith that is alone. To truly receive the words of God is to intentionally, with a joyous faith in Jesus and an active reliance on his spirit, obey those teachings. We must be doers of the word, not merely hearers of the word. If exposure to God's word in the spoken gospel and the scriptures doesn't influence our behavior, if the transformation of our inner heart doesn't extend to our outer lifestyle, we may well be wandering in a dream, the same dream that Jesus spoke of. The people who will, say, who will hear him say to them on judgment day, depart from me. Jesus said the one who enters the kingdom of God will be the one who does the will of the Father. And Jesus' very own brother, did you know that Jesus had a brother? He had a brother and his name was James and James became one of his disciples. Very likely he was not a disciple at the time that he heard Jesus preach this sermon, but he became one of Jesus' disciples and he wrote a book in the New Testament. Can you guess which one? The book of James. He said, in chapter 2, verse 17 of his letter, that faith without works is what? Dead. dead. Faith without works is dead. Now, if you've been listening to this message up to this point, you may be scratching your head and thinking, didn't you just say that activism is not enough? And as a result of that confusion, it might lead you to another question. Okay then, what is God's will? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I believe that the answer to that question lies in the response of God to the religious lost on Judgment Day. What does God say to those who are lost? Depart from me, for I never knew you. That little word, knew. In the King James Version of the Bible, which was translated 500 years ago in a vernacular of English that none of us speaks anymore. But in the King James Version of the Bible, Genesis chapter four, verse one, says this. Adam knew his wife and she conceived. In the New International Version, which is more familiar to a lot of us, that same verse is translated, Adam made love to his wife and she became pregnant. And in the New Living Translation, it says, Adam had sexual relationship with his wife and she became pregnant. So why do I bring that up? I bring it up because I believe the secret of what Jesus wants us to see in this passage in Matthew 7 is in that little word, no, or new. On your notes, you see a paragraph there for you to contemplate that says, while faith in Jesus does require our rational thoughts, faith is not merely about thinking. While faith does engage our emotions, we must love the Lord with all of our hearts. Faith doesn't culminate in our passions. And while religious faith may bring about great displays of life change, saving faith grows out of a living relationship with God that bears fruit to testify of its own existence. So what I would have us contemplate today is this. Who is first in your thoughts? In your mind? As you plan your career path, who is first in your thoughts? As you choose a university major, who's first in your thoughts? 
As you spend or invest your money, who is first in your thoughts? As you interact in a physical relationship with your family and your network of relationships, who is first in your thoughts? Is it Jesus? And who's first in your service to the church or to the community? Is it the church or the community who will see you serving and admire you because of that? Or is it Jesus? Do you offer whatever services you offer to the church or to the community to express your gratitude and your devotion to Jesus for all that he's done for you? As we go back to 1985 at the bus stop where I got off that bus bewildered, I had no idea how it was gonna get back to where I needed to be. But what happened next is something that repeated itself over and over and over again for the six years that I lived in China. Whenever I was lost, whether I knew it or not, God always sent someone who spoke my language and was willing to help show me the way. That day outside at that bus stop, when I got off that bus, I found someone who told me the next bus that I needed to catch. And not only did they tell me they stayed there with me at the bus stop, they inconvenienced themselves so that to make sure I got on the right bus. So my prayer for all of us today is that our hearts will hear the words of Jesus. These are Jesus' words in John 17, 3. And may you hear these words in your heart today. He's about to define for us eternal life. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We may think of eternal life as a mansion, or streets of gold, or eternal health. But in Jesus' definition, eternal life means knowing God. In the way that Adam knew his wife, in an intimate relationship with God, we know him and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Jesus is our avenue in relationship with God. He is the way that we get there. Amen. Praise God. He doesn't want us to just accomplish things. He doesn't want us to just feel things. He doesn't want us to just know things. He wants us to experience him in relationship, to know him in that intimate way. So my prayer continues that on the great day of the Lord, we won't hear, depart from me, for I never knew you. But rather we will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, welcome home. Would you stand with me and I will pray and then our worship team will join us and we'll worship one more time together. Let's pray. Father, we are awed when we think that there is a God who created this world and everything that we see who desires a relationship with us. When we think about the vastness of the universe and you even beyond that vastness, it's hard to imagine that you would desire a relationship with us. And yet you show us in the life of your son that that is indeed what you desire. So Father, I pray that today we may lay down the shackles of obligation and we may take up the blessing of relationship with the one true God. So may you do your work in the hearts of your people today that wherever we stand with you, that we will come to you and know that you desire to have a relationship with us. We thank you for making that possible. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen.